Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. And thank you for taking some time off your lunch today to join us for this webinar. We're going to explore climate resilience and the role that salmon safe and green infrastructure play in making more sustainable and resilient communities. My name is Andrea McDonald and I'm the program coordinator with Salmon Safe BC. And I'm joined here today by Salmon Safe's program manager, Teresa Fresco, who will be helping behind the scenes to address some of the questions and help moderate the discussion period as well. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that the Salmon Safe team is currently working from the traditional unceded and rightful lands of the Squamish Nation and lands of the Comox First Nation as well. It's important to recognize and acknowledge that Indigenous peoples have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial and have been disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. I wanted to note that some of the topics that we'll be discussing in the presentations today may be triggering to those who have been directly impacted by extreme weather events in, pre in the previous years as well as recognizing that the use of green infrastructure has often been prioritized for more privileged and urban communities, which leaves a lot of underserved communities more vulnerable to climate change. However, it is our hope that through this discussion, we can provide a more hopeful lens to see a future that finds a sustainable and appropriate way to integrate indigenous knowledge systems into some of the technical works that we're discussing here today to provide more resilient and equitable communities for everybody. Now, for those who are not familiar, Salmon Safe is one of Canada's first certification programs linking land management practices with the protection of watersheds. So by adopting Salmon Safe standards, developers, landowners, and property managers can help protect salmon habitat and water quality to ensure that this iconic species will thrive for future generations. So this is the second webinar in a series of webinars planned for this year, with the first taking place back in the spring of 2021, which focused on the Salmon Safe Agriculture Program. So please feel free to search us up on YouTube to find the past recordings of these webinars and others um, to find more information. And Salmon Safe also plans to host more webinars, both focusing on resilience and a couple other topics coming up this year. So please follow us on social media and or you can sign up for our mailing list through our website to get the most up-to-date information. And we're also uh, planning on having a follow-up to the Car Tire Dialogue, which was one of our most attended webinars coming up in the spring. So make sure you stay connected and stay tuned. We'd also like to take a second to thank our supporters for making this webinar and all of Salmon Safe's work possible. For this webinar, um, we ask that folks remain muted for the entirety of the presentation and only unmute to engage in discussion and or ask questions. You're welcome to keep your video on as long as you'd like. However, this webinar is being recorded, so please be aware that this content will be posted on the Fraser Basin Council Salmon Safe YouTube playlist for those who want to join but were not able to do so in attending today. Today's objective is to explore the role of Salmon Safe and green infrastructure in planning a more climate resilient community. As, um, as I know, it can be a bit of a buzzword for those who are not familiar. Green infrastructure it is also sometimes referred to as nature-based solutions. And these are systems that aim to mimic or kind of uh, adopt some of the practices that nature already provided by capturing and cleaning, providing better water quality, air quality, uh, better green space, providing habitat, and many, many other benefits. And you've probably seen green infrastructure systems in your own community in the form of a rain garden, a city park, a green roof, or even just a beautiful untouched wetland. We're going to start today by exploring resilience and salmon safe, a bit of a background, followed by our two speakers who will introduce, introduce momentarily, and they're going to discuss similar topics at a citywide scale with the city of Vancouver and explore how salmon safe incorporates climate resilience into its practices. We'll then enter a question and answer period for roughly 15 minutes before we adjourn promptly at 1.30 p.m. today. I'm going to be your first speaker actually today, setting the stage by defining the problem and exploring climate impacts from the previous year and highlight the importance of resilience-based planning, which will then lead into a backgrounder of Salmon Safe. Then you're gonna hear from our two wonderful speakers who will discuss two different but very similar approaches to promoting climate resilience in an urban context. Our first speaker, uh, Nick Mead Fox, is a green infrastructure engineer from the city of Vancouver 
who will be exploring how the city is working to enhance design standards and incorporate climate resilience, as well as the implementation of green infrastructure in a more rules-based approach to a, at a citywide scale. Then we'll hear from Anna Huddle, Certification Director with Salmon Safe, who, is, who will explore how Salmon Safe promotes resilience through its core standards via voluntary approach for developers and landowners to encourage more sustainable site level design. So what is this other buzzword, resilience? When you think of the word, some people may come to mind that have demonstrated resilience in your life, perhaps a community, a certain wildlife species, an ecosystem, or even maybe a human-made product that you own that's quite resilient. Um, in a more scientific-based definition, the most recent um, report from the International Panel on Climate Change, also commonly known as the IPCC, uh, that came out actually just a couple days ago, I believe, the resilient, they defined resilience in the literature has a wide range of meanings. Adaptation is often organized around resilience as bouncing back and returning to a previous state after disturbance. And more broadly, the term describes not just the ability to maintain essential function, identity and structure, but also the capacity for transformation. So we can think about this both for communities and for wild salmon. In the case of wild salmon, it's the population's ability to respond to perturbations to the environment and habitat. And similarly for communities, it's the ability for a community to respond and recover to climate impacts, similar to those that we witnessed in the previous year. So not that we all need a reminder, but 2021 was an unprecedented year in terms of climate impacts, especially in British Columbia. Starting in January 2021, which feels like forever ago, we had a massive windstorm that resulted in an estimated $134 million worth of insured damages across Western Canada, according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and it caused power outages for over 220,000 customers. The wind speed warnings really set a tone of extreme weather advisories that would become much too familiar for the rest of the province for the remainder of that year. In June 2021, we saw record high temperatures of almost 50 degrees Celsius broken, especially in Lytton, BC, during an unprecedented heat wave that resulted in nearly 600 deaths across the province. Last year, the wildfire season also burned an estimated 868,000 hectares across the province and led to further soil and slope instability foreshadowing what was to come later that fall. These impacts not only resulted in a loss of essential forest habitat for wildlife, but impacted hundreds and thousands of people directly and indirectly. The trauma that was experienced by these communities is unimaginable over the past few years, especially disproportionately impacting Indigenous and underserved communities. Then, more recently in November 2021, we saw record-breaking precipitation in the form of atmospheric rivers, which resulted in flooding across the province in an estimated insured damage cost of over $450 million. Many were stranded from the landslides that damaged or completely destroyed many parts of eight major highways, essentially cutting off the coast of BC from the rest of Canada. Also parts of BC witnessed over 300% greater rainfall than what was normally recorded for that time of the year. So now that I've thrown a bunch of big numbers to show the magnitude of climate impacts, I want to acknowledge that many folks here today probably have been feeling and witnessing these changes in their own communities as well. The impacts of climate change are no longer a threat that we're going to face in 20 years, but something that we're actively working to address today. One of the objectives of this webinar was actually to raise money to be able to donate to Food Banks BC, which does really amazing work in providing essential services for folks who have been impacted by hardships over the past few years. And I can say that we've successfully raised over $200 and I've opened the donation window on Eventbrite to 5 p.m. today. So if you feel like you'd like to go back or encourage somebody else to participate, then please, of course, do so. Of course, it also wouldn't be a salmon safe webinar if we didn't acknowledge that these negative impacts are heavily felt by wild salmon populations through the loss of habitat, sedimentation of waterways, disruption of spawning beds, having warmer waters, as well as increased pollution that drains off urban impervious surfaces. But after defining the problem, we don't want to be just doom and gloom. So what can be done about this? Well, climate resilience planning in incorporated into overall community planning can become um, more essential than ever now. BC has, is projected to have warmer, wetter winters and even hotter and drier summers 
with extreme weather events that we've witnessed recently, unfortunately becoming more frequent and potentially greater in magnitude. In an urban context, climate change can result in impacts that are dangerous for both people and wild salmon, um, with significant increases in stormwater runoff, which can cause flooding, increased pollution in nearby waterways, with our drier and hotter summers, which also means increased urban heat, especially in neighborhoods with limited green space, as well as warmer waters, which are quite lethal to salmon. So incorporating these steps into planning for urban centers and communities to be more prepared, adaptive, and resilient to these projected and current impacts of climate change is absolutely essential. Now, green infrastructure has been found to be, um, to have the capacity to adapt to climate change if they're properly implemented. But it also can act as a mitigation strategy to climate change as well. And plus, who doesn't really love a nice green rain garden like the one shown here at the MEC site downtown Vancouver? Canada, as an entire country, is actually facing one of its most significant infrastructure crises in history with aging infrastructure all across the country and it, it's needing a lot of replacement and repairs coupled with the increased threats from climate change. It's really highlighting the importance of adaptable and resilient forms of infrastructure which will become more and more necessary as we move to more sustainable and resilient urban centers and communities more broadly. So that brings us to salmon safe. So green infrastructure is an essential part of the salmon safe program. And in British Columbia, the Salmon Safe program is hosted under the Fraser Basin Council, which I am a staff member of. FBC is a nonprofit NGO with a mission to advance sustainability throughout British Columbia by promoting social well being, supported by a vibrant economy, and sustained by a healthy environment. The Salmon Safe certification program was initially founded by the Pacific Rivers Council and expanded into BC back in 2011 in partnership with the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Now in 2018, FBC took leadership over the program, which can still be found along the Pacific coast of North America. The certification program um, has eight main program areas that certify developments, agricultural sites, major infrastructure projects, parks and natural areas, and most recently accreditation for developer and designer firms. The urban program, which we will focus primarily on today, has six core standards which apply to each site that seeks certification and two context dependent standards as well that apply for sites that have water courses running through or nearby. Our second speaker, Anna Huddle, will actually discuss the standards in a bit more detail, providing an kind of a background to the climate resilience aspect of them. But just a quick overview that the standards promote sustainable rainwater management, water use management, so reducing water use on site, best practices for erosion and sediment control practices, um, safe pesticide use and water quality protection, enhancement of e urban ecological function, so things like improving habitat for pollinators and urban wildlife, and then our newest standard of climate resiliency planning, so planning for climate impacts into the future. Presently, there are three certified sites in the Lower Mainland with roughly 11 sites um, in progress on track for certification in, coming, in the coming years. Um, so we have the MEC head office and flagship store in Vancouver, as well as YVR International Airport, which are all certified. And we have uh, upcoming sites from the North Shore of Vancouver all the way down to Victoria on Vancouver Island. Now, without further ado, I'd like to present our next speaker, Nick Mead Fox, a green infrastructure engineer with the City of Vancouver and a current Master of Resource and Environmental Management student with the Pacific Water Research Center at Simon Fraser University. Nick has, uh, is going to showcase some of the city of Vancouver's efforts to implement more climate resilient based planning through infrastructure design, through the use of green infrastructure and enhanced design standards at a citywide scale. And then following Nick's presentation, I'll hand it off to Anna, who's going to share more about how Salmon Safe is incorporating resilient approach into its site level design and a voluntary eco certification program standards. Wonderful. So I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Nick. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was great. So I will share my screen here. All right. So can everyone see that okay? Perfect. Excellent. So as Andrea mentioned, uh, I'm a green infrastructure engineer at the city of Vancouver, and my primary responsibility there is developing green infrastructure standards. And throughout this presentation, I'll be 
sort of connecting why I think green infrastructure standards are so essential for any uh, urban or uh, any development resilience planning for climate change. So I'll be talking about climate change risks to infrastructure. I'll be talking about city of Vancouver's resilience planning, uh, some of our green infrastructure planning, and how we hope to accelerate change with green infrastructure standards. So as Andrea mentioned, we're facing all of these different environmental threats from climate change. At the same time, we have significant population growth here. We have aging infrastructure, we have densification, and all of these things lead to the necessity of rethinking water management. And uh, as Andrea also mentioned, the IPCC sixth assessment really focused on the reality that adaptation is a, an incredibly important part of dealing with the impacts of climate change. A lot of these effects are locked in and we need infrastructure that can accommodate them. Unfortunately, the pace of infrastructure change is very slow. Uh, infrastructure is built for 50 to 100 year timeframes and is often used well past its intended lifespan. Uh, much of our infrastructure is due for replacement or repair, and significant infrastructure investment is expected. Uh, failure of this infrastructure is always catastrophic. There are opportunities, though, for accelerating this change. Uh, infrastructure needs, whether from climate change or regular uh, maintenance needs, are an opportunity to make infrastructure do more for our communities, more than just connecting A to B at faster speeds or providing accommodation, which is essential, Infrastructure can also support our communities and our environment. Uh, because our infrastructure cycles of development and repair are so slow, when something needs building, we need to do it right. In the city of Vancouver, a really big part of that is the Rain City Strategy, which was endorsed by our council in November, 2019. Uh, it consists of nine transformative directions, three action plans, and is a high level 30 year plan to manage rainwater through green rainwater infrastructure. And the goal of this is to protect, restore, and mimic the natural water cycle, because this water cycle is really what protects so much of our infrastructure, and, with, and our infrastructure needs to be able to manage that, uh, that natural water cycle flow. One common theme of the Rain City strategy is improving urban resilience. It calls on us to adapt to new climate conditions, learn from new research, accommodate urbanization, build better communities, and overall, calls on us to make really big changes to how we plan our cities, how we manage our watersheds, ecosystem health, infrastructure practices, and municipal priorities. Urban resilience really requires accelerating this transition from traditional infrastructure to green infrastructure. And once an urban area is established, changing it is incredibly slow. Green infrastructure is our main tool for making our sewer sheds more resilient and protecting our infrastructure. It uses vegetation, soils, and other engineered systems to mimic natural processes required to manage water and create resilient and healthier urban environments. Uh, the water management component of green infrastructure uh, is primarily focused on water quality and water quantity. So we filter water through these soil columns to provide quality improvements uh, and these systems also retain rainwater at the surface level to prevent overflow within our sewer system. Uh, green infrastructure can be used to fortify shorelines. And uh, as was highlighted this past summer, it, it's incredibly important to also try to cool down our cities with green infrastructure. The more canopy and green space we have, uh, the less the urban heat island effect will like, create some of the deadliest natural disasters in Canada. Uh, green infrastructure from a planning perspective also increases access to green space, it creates desirable walking and cycling routes and connects parks and ecological areas. And this is a really important part of resilience too. We need our cities to be enjoyable places to live. We need our cities to be connected throughout catastrophes and we need our cities to support the human activities that all make us have uh, enjoyable and thriving lives. So from a, a planning level, uh, the Rain City strategy assesses the different sewer sheds within or watersheds from a, a nature-based perspective or sewer sheds in an urban context. Uh, and it identifies a lot of the sort of goals and indicators that characterize these watersheds to try to drive our implementation planning to address those needs. We have these uh, nine indicators here, uh, which have been applied to each of these different watershed, sewer shed areas. Uh, to try to determine what these specific needs are. 
Overall, right now, we have 265 green rainwater infrastructure assets in Vancouver's right-of-way. So this isn't uh, counting the green infrastructure that's on private sites like green roofs. Th these are things that the city is managing within our own property, which is the, the street, the right-of-way. Uh, the goal set out in the Rain City strategy is to manage 40% of citywide impervious areas by 2050. 2050. Right now, we are managing about 1%. So we have significant strides to make in the next 28 years. And that is exactly what the standardization effort that the city of Vancouver is embarking on is really intended to do, to ramp up where we are now. Uh, in 2022, at the left here, we've, we've managed about 3.3 hectares and we're, we're going to ramp up significantly, uh, adding a huge amount of capacity every year until we can reach this target. The only way to get there is to make green infrastructure business as usual. And we do that through familiarizing consultants, contractors, and city staff with green infrastructure best practices and standardizing green infrastructure so that consultants don't have to come up with their own best practices. And so that city reviewers aren't reviewing a million different plans without the tools to assess their potential performance and longevity. So engineering standards, uh, what are they? Why are they important? Why do they need to change? And what are we doing about it? So the Standards Council of Canada has this definition. It is incredibly dry and boring. And I think it really undersells the reality that infrastructure standards are what keep us safe in our built environments and enable the transportation, accommodation, and trade that underpins our lives. Standards improve public safety. They simplify the approval process. They enforce best practices. They reduce design costs. They promote durability and reliability. They provide methods and tools for meeting city goals. And they're an essential part of performing our due diligence to reduce liability exposure for municipalities and ensure that infrastructure is created in the most responsible way possible. Uh, standards can take many different forms. Uh, green infrastructure needs all of them. The primary forms that standards take are standard drawings, design guidelines, construction specifications, performance criteria. All of these are standards. Uh, every single one of these categories needs to be created for green infrastructure. And because green infrastructure is relatively new, uh, it is really, really important that all of these different categories are constructed. Uh, we don't have a lot of expertise on how these systems work best. And that's what the City of Vancouver Green Infrastructure Implementation Department is really trying to do, establish these best practices and then enforce them. So while I can speak in a very excited way about these standards, I know that they are really boring for almost everyone, including most engineers. Uh, but they are really, really important. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to implement them as well. So resilience requires a little more flexibility than traditional infrastructure standards, which are very prescriptive. You know, you need to build things exactly this way. And we need a little bit more flexibility uh, and also minimum performance requirements. So we certainly need to make sure that our infrastructure can handle the storms we're expecting, but we also need to allow for the experimentation, which is gonna allow us to weather those storms in the future. Uh, that's why it's important to specify in our standards, what is a rule, requirement, best practice, or target. All of these things have to change though. So we know that we have common standards for transportation, water and sewage, telecoms, energy, public safety. These are standards which I think uh, even non-engineers are somewhat familiar with. They know that these things are standardized because when you go on a road, it's generally always built the same. Uh, the new standards that we really need to make more resilient cities have to do with sustainability, access to nature, preserving biodiversity, improving well-being, and these are much more difficult to define and therefore much more difficult to standardize, protect, and build, and maintain. So uh, there are many, many challenges of changing standards. Uh, standards that are in place in municipalities, provinces, nationally, these are developed over many decades. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're essential for protecting public safety, enforcing best practices, but they're also referenced by thousands of consultants, contractors, and city staff. And every time you change them, you need to keep those groups familiar with these standards. And so the changes that we know we need to make more resilient cities uh, need to be approved of and supported by all of these different groups. 
Um, standards are also really interdependent. So we're trying to embark on this process of creating green infrastructure standards. And uh, there are many different groups that provide input on these standards because they affect every engineering department of the city from waste management to sewers, to water distribution, to street design, transportation. All of these groups have input that they need to provide to the development of these standards. Uh, city governments and city engineers are also risk averse. They generally uh, do not want change because it puts their uh, best practices at risk and it puts their like what they're used to in question. So uh, while it's hard to change any set of standards, there's some specific challenges to developing green infrastructure standards. Uh, they are design dense. So there's a whole bunch of different design decisions that need to be accomplished in the development of uh, green infrastructure systems. Uh, they require a lot of different disciplines, landscape architecture, hydraulic engineering, uh, environmental engineering, transportation design. Uh, they also are integrated into these local standard documents. Every municipality has different standards and therefore uh, each municipality is responsible for creating new standards that match with their existing ones. And not every municipality is gonna have a green infrastructure team uh, or even a single green infrastructure employee to do this work. Uh, they are also designed for a whole bunch of benefits and risks. Uh, they also are often subject to what I call the monitoring evaluation trap. Whenever you're creating a new system, uh, there's a temptation to test everything about that system throughout its entire life. And a lot of municipalities have created these uh, trial systems for green infrastructure where they put in a single system, they're gonna monitor it for a decade but we don't have that time right now to delay implementation on something that we know performs really well from both modeling and monitoring studies performed all across the globe. This is a very proven technology. Uh, and while there's some things that should be confirmed locally, uh, a lot of this can be referenced from other studies and municipalities. And finally, of course, it's difficult to implement standards on something that has evolving best practices. Green infrastructure is a new field. There are things about green infrastructure systems which will change in the next decade. We will come up with new materials, uh, new system designs that will supersede any standards we adopt now, but that's part of the process. We need to adopt standards while we can and then make them change. Uh, finally, a lot of the work we're doing is focused on sharing the standards we have developed. So we have a, a large set of green infrastructure standard drawings. We have design manual guidance. We have construction specifications. We have modeling guides. We have planting recommendations. And we're sharing these through the Green Rainwater Infrastructure Municipal Exchange. Uh, I know some of our members are here today and that group focuses on sharing green infrastructure best practices between all the Metro Vancouver municipalities uh, to try to accelerate this transition towards greener infrastructure standards. The Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange is a North America wide organization. Uh, and there are employees from municipalities that are leading the adoption of green infrastructure throughout North America that attend these meetings. Uh, there's different working groups on different subtopics about green infrastructure that we get into. And finally, the Pacific Water Research Center here in Greater Vancouver uh, is a research association that tries to connect uh, water-related water practitioners from a whole bunch of different fields uh, to try to improve coordination between not only the disciplines, but also municipal governments, academics, nonprofits, I like this connection here between Salmon Site and the city of Vancouver. So that is my presentation today. Thank you so much. I believe we're, we're deferring questions until the end, but I look forward to those whenever they come. Thank you. So I'll pass it on Thank, you. Thank you, Nick. And I will just pass it right along to Anna, who you can start sharing your screen and she's gonna share a little bit more about Salmon Safe. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks, Nick. Um, well, building directly off of what Nick just shared about the amazing thinking and the work that the city of Vancouver is doing, I'm honored to share how Salmon Safe has been working with both cities and individual development sites across the Salish Sea on implementing climate resilience. Um, again, Anna Huddle, I'm Salmon Safe Certification Director based in Oregon, where Salmon Safe began back in the 1990s. 
Through thoughtful site planning, implementation of low impact design solutions and thoughtful stormwater management, landowners and developers have the opportunity to both contribute to the restoration of our urban watersheds and build climate resilience, especially with respect to changes in precipitation. So what that looks like at the city scale could include large scale projects like green streets, riparian habitat restoration and district wide water reclamation and reuse efforts. Whereas at an individual site scale, <clears throat> smaller but still very impactful measures can include green roofs, uh, permeable paving, low input landscapes, and on-site stormwater management through green stormwater infrastructure. Sam and Safe has had the tremendous opportunity to work on a number of with a number of different jurisdictions on these ideas. And one example is the city of Shoreline and the ecological enhancement work that they've been doing as part of their Sam and Safe certification. In urban environments, roadways are one of the largest sources of impervious surface and greatest sources then of water pollution. The city of Shoreline has adopted a complete streets policy that requires development of a transportation system that allows for safe and convenient travel for all users. And although this original concept is focused on facilitating multimodal transportation, the city and CMSAF saw an opportunity to incorporate green stormwater infrastructure elements in the city's standards for use in the right of way. The city has completed pilot projects that include vegetation in the amenity zone and that provide stormwater management and urban habitat. The city is also in the process of revising its engineering development manual to reflect this expanded use of the right of way to include green stormwater infrastructure. <clears throat> in addition, the city has committed to incorporating GSI elements into all newly constructed sidewalks as feasible. These reconstructed areas will provide resilience through both the enhanced ecological function and increased capacity to handle extreme storm events brought on by climate shifts for both water quality and water quantity treatment. King County Parks very recently formalized Salmon Safe certification for its 28,000 acre park system encompassing over 200 parks. King County Parks has created an inventory of stormwater infrastructure across its portfolio and will be working towards a summary report that includes an estimate of the percent of impervious surface in each park and a summary of the estimated total percent impervious area for natural areas and developed parks. The report will also list any special stormwater mitigation projects that have been completed at each park, such as a reduction in pavement, detention ponds, or biofiltration swales, and identify and prioritize op any opportunities for additional stormwater mitigation at each park. Um, and although this could seem like a tedious or a clerical task, this list will become a powerful resource to inform future stormwater management decisions by documenting the effectiveness of various stormwater management alternatives. In addition to that stormwater work, King County Parks will be working on a water conservation plan to support the overall goal of limiting irrigation to high priority sites based on public use and restoration work. Tracking of water use for irrigation as an integral part of this plan. Many park sites have separate meters for tracking irrigation water usage, but there's an opportunity to analyze the data from these meters and create a trend analysis for irrigation water used at each park and system-wide using historical data as well as future data to be collected. The analysis will incorporate factors that may influence water use such as weather, particularly in the face of a changing climate, um, the need for plant establishment and leaks in irrigation systems. So like the stormwater work, the results of this analysis will allow the county to identify opportunities for future water use reduction and evaluating success. And lastly, on our city work here in Portland, where I am, um, as part of the City of Portland SAMA Safe certification, they conducted an integrated stormwater management assessment for all managed properties. This work was led by the Bureau of Environmental Services, who evaluated opportunities for providing additional quantity and quality treatment of stormwater runoff across properties evaluating whether each priority property had capacity for on-site treatment of stormwater runoff, runoff generated by precipitation events equal to 95% of the average annual runoff. The Bureau then prepared a report identifying and prioritizing opportunities to meet this goal based on criteria related to existing water quality and aquatic habitat risk levels, as well as the size of the area drained, 
the potential for contamination and stormwater drainage caused by industrial activities or vehicles and drainage to separated or combined sewer areas. The city is actively working towards implementing projects to address those prioritized opportunities. Shifting gears um, to that site scale, I wanted to talk about Salmon Safe's urban standards more specifically. As a topic of growing concern that will affect all aspects of ecological health, last spring, Salmon Safe created the new site climate resiliency planning category within its urban standards to more explicitly address climate change. More directly, the Salmon Safe standards address how individual sites and development projects can adopt a climate change approach addressing increased temperature and changes in precipitation. The climate change approaches can be incorporated directly into the design of the site or through an adaptive management plan for existing sites. The site climate resiliency planning category focuses on how elements of climate change, like the ones we've been focusing on around increased temperature and changes in precipitation, will impact urban watersheds and the health of Salmanas, and how these impacts can be reduced or eliminated through site climate resiliency planning. The standards in this category reference the US Global Change Research Project, which like other climate change research done in Canada and internationally, highlights that regional warming and changes to the historical precipitation patterns have been linked to changes in the timing and the amount of water availability. The impacts of a warming planet have been far, have far reaching implications, including increased seasonal temperatures, the changes in precipitation, uh, but also sea level rise, health impacts on humans, including increased respiratory and cardiovascular disease and forest health, um, to unfortunately name just a few. Uh, Region-wide summer temperature increases and in certain basins, increased river flooding and winter flows and decreased summer flows will threaten many freshwater species, particularly salmon, steelhead and trout. Depending on climate change modeling assumptions made and by multiple efforts, uh, by, night, by 2070, it's projected that the average annual temperature could increase from approximately one and a half to five and a half degrees Celsius when compared to temperatures from the late 20th century. The modeling efforts suggest the greatest temperature increases will occur during the warmer months, which is exactly what we observed in our region last summer, um, as Andrea so pointed out so clearly. Um, across the western half of Canada, we saw record highs, including many all-time record high temperatures. And then on the rainfall front, regional climate model, models project increases of up to 20% in extreme daily precipitation, depending on location. The number of days with more than one inch of precipitation is projected to increase by 13%. This increased precip precipitation is projected to occur during the late fall to early spring and summer pre precipitation is anticipated to decrease. Together, warming temperature impacts on watersheds with significant snow melt contributing to spring and summer stream flows will likely result in lower su summer flows. And salmonid species life stages are inherently tied to historic climate patterns and the resulting stream flow patterns. So any changes to flooding, duration of flows and water temperatures may adversely impact salmon species. So this brings me uh, to standard 6.1, which is the first of two standards within this new category, which asks site managers to assess regional climate change impacts on site design and elements related to each of the core standard categories based on 50 year projections and to provide a short description of potential climate change future conditions related to temperature and precipitation. Um, and I did just want to note that we recognize that BC as a province is referencing 100 year, 100 year projections using the one in 100 year storm as a guide, which is even better. Um, so in terms of performance requirements for this standard, we're asking teams to prepare a general overview of the potential impacts climate change will or may have in several categories, including stormwater, water use, erosion prevention and sediment control, site elevation, water quality protection and landscaping, enhancement of urban ecological function, in-stream habitat protection and restoration, and riparian wetland and locally significant vegetation protection and restoration. So let's look at each of these in more detail. On the stormwater front, we wanna consider changes to peaks, seasonality and volume, thinking about how more of our precipitation landing during a smaller time window um, means more extreme storm events. And the need to think about stormwater infrastructure with that future condition in mind. 
In water use, we're looking at less rainfall arriving during the season when it's most needed and how we can respond to that change in water availability through thoughtful plant selection and different sources of water, such as recycled gray water. With erosion prevention and sediment control, our primary concerns remain um, during the construction stage with an increased capacity for sediment transport to streams and surface water during more intense storm events. But there may also be implications for sites with steep slopes or significant grade changes across the site um, that can occur even after a site, a new development is constructed. Site elevation that considers the long-term sustainability of a building siting in terms of the distance from a, a floodplain, um, that's delineation may shift in the future to encroach upon the built area. Um, but also in cases where there isn't an opportunity to perhaps move a building further away from a designated floodplain to think about the potential for raising the building up. Um, and the 100 year standard, a flood standard may be inadequate at certain project sites as climate impacts increase. Water quality protection in landscaping asks teams to consider the landscaping inputs such as fertilizer and pesticides and how those inputs can remain minimized in the face of climate change. Um, and I wanted to share an example from Salmon State's agricultural work. Uh, hop growers throughout the region last summer experienced escalated threats from spider mites um, during the last growing season because of the drier and hotter weather conditions, which alone put pressure on crops, but also created the perfect habitat conditions for the mites, the mites um, allowing for explosive pest growth and the need to utilize um, a less than desirable pesticide in order to simply save crops from demise. Um, so those same kinds of threats um, are a consideration in the, the urban sector as well. Urban ecological function asks teams to consider how enhancing the ecological function of a site by providing more vegetated and pervious spaces can help provide stormwater treatment as well as habitat for urban wildlife and alleviate heat island impacts. In-stream habitat protection and restoration is a topic specific to sites that have a waterway within their property boundary. And in the context of climate change, asks projects to consider the rising air temperatures and the effect that they'll have on water temperatures and thus aquatic life. And by protecting and restoring uh, the actual water body, including the stream bed and bank, an urban refuge can be created. And lastly, uh, riparian wetland and locally significant vegetation invites projects to think about the areas closest to those surface water bodies and how they can be protected and restored to again uh, mitigate the worst of the anticipated climate change impacts. Standard 6.2 then looks for the knowledge gained in that 6.1 research and work to be applied to a site's design specifically around stormwater, um, asking teams whether stormwater facilities are sized to effectively address projected future precipitation changes related to rainfall intensity and duration. So are project stormwater facilities expandable? Is there adequate conveyance for emergency overflow? Um, these kinds of things. Then in irrigation and landscaping, Plant selection and maintenance activities should be updated to reflect longer try periods in the summer months and increased evapotranspiration from those increased temperatures. Um, good old heat islands in our urban environment. Urban developments have been found to, of course, absorb, absorb and retain solar heat, creating localized heat islands. So conceptual site plans need to consider those impacts of building materials and locations to reduce this impact, as well as consider perhaps the adverse impact of shadows from buildings on existing or proposed vegetation. Um, but on the flip side, those shadows um, from trees and, and other neighboring um, assets can be used to shade impervious surfaces, um, such as roads and parking. So looking at dual benefit there. In stream and riparian habitats, uh, stream and wetland conservation and restoration measures should be adopted to provide a level of ecological function adapted to more extreme climate conditions, such as potentially higher and more frequent flooding in winter and increased stream temperatures and reduced stream flows in the summer. And then lastly, site climate resiliency itself, um, asking teams to prepare a brief narrative outlining potential adaptive management strategies for future site climate resiliency. So um, thinking about this idea on an ongoing basis. 
The strategies should include monitoring and metrics related to climate change that can be used to guide when site characteristics related to these things like stormwater, um, irrigation, and vegetation should be adjusted. So we've been, I've been talking about Salmon Safe's urban development standards, which are the first to incorporate these approaches to climate resiliency. But in our next iterations of our other certification standards, we plan to build in these same principles in a way that relates to each different site typology. And while there are other measures that global leaders can have, and hopefully will continue to take to lessen um, the greatest impacts from climate change, it's these on the ground efforts that will allow us humans, um, salmonids, and the rest of our ecosystem to weather um, some of these unavoidable impacts from climate shifts, uh, hopefully more, more smoothly, gracefully, and with less um, emergency response. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to any questions you all have for Nick, Andrea, and myself. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna, for presenting. Um, and for Nick, those were both wonderful presentations. I'm going to open it up now for a question and answer period, as well as just general discussion. So if folks would like to um, have anybody engage in the discussion, you're more than welcome to do so. So if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question, you can do so by clicking on the reactions and raising your hand, um, and I will call on you. And if you would like to also post a question in the chat function, you're more than welcome to do that as well, and Teresa will read it out um, on your behalf. So if there's any questions, please feel free to raise your hand uh, or post it in the chat. Yes, uh, Tamara. Hi, um, I, I loved your presentation and I love the detail that uh, we're looking at such a high increase in temperature and how we can build towards that resiliency. Um, I'm really concerned about the Portland Metro uh, resiliency because we've sustained extended drought and our street trees are literally dying. And so I have put a call to the city to see if they can put in more emergency funds to deal with the fire hazard uh, that is being presented. I wanted to get your uh, take on how we as a neighborhood uh, in Northeast Portland can build our resiliency in our area. I mean, I'm thinking about mulching, you know, getting platoons of people to get out and mulching all the trees they can. Um, of course, it has to be done sensibly and, and correctly. Um, but what else can we do? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that observation about the street trees and that question. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure that Portland is is not alone. Or well, maybe we are, and then maybe that would be a good thing in terms of street trees. But um, yeah, I think there's there's so many wonderful strategies that we can do. I think, um, yeah, certainly mulching is excellent um, for those street trees right of ways. Um, I think also thinking about, um, you know, this is a program specific to Portland, but another voluntary program through the Portland Audubon, the Backyard Habitat Certification, um, and just the principles that it encourages um, to basically apply these salmon, similar salmon safe standards, but to an individual residential scale, a, a single family home or apartment complex. So um, inviting those native and adapted species. I think we also, um, and as part of that, I think removing lawn area that can get quite crisp when we're trying to be thoughtful and not irrigated during the summer, which I think a lot of Portlanders and Cascadians are, are mindful of. Um, I think those are, those are a good start. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think just finding ways to support our, our urban wildlife, like the, the birds by trying to provide bird baths and, um, you know, in another way, bat houses and those kinds of opportunities where our urbanization might have eliminated their natural habitat. Uh, those are just to start. <laughs> well, it, would there be um, 
uh, monies uh, in available for creating, uh, you know, catchment systems for uh, urban stormwater that could then be used on a neighborhood scale. Uh, I I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, in, in different basins, ways in which we can work together instead of it let, letting that water run off in a typical storm drainage uh, in a built environment, diverting that somehow. Absolutely. I, I, I did just post a link in the chat here to the Portland Environmental Services Tree Program, which does a lot of work to retrofit uh, street trees to receive road runoff like that. I know uh, from a design perspective, a real challenge we've had in the city of Vancouver with retrofitting existing trees is that often the root systems are slightly above the road elevation. Right? You have the curb coming up and then you have the trees there. So if you excavate that out, you're putting those roots at risk. Uh, and it is, it's very difficult to sort of dig out just between the street trees and try to get that depression low enough so you can get that road runoff into your uh, street tree corridor. Uh, but I think that is really the solution that uh, Portland will need to look for. And it's something that Vancouver is trying to do in as many places as possible. Well, I'm actually thinking of a way in which uh, you can, you know, siphon the water off of uh, the trough area on the street into a, uh, a catchment uh, that could then yeah. be applied to the street trees. So, so often there's either curb cuts in the roadway. So that's just like a, a cut in the curb that exactly as you're saying, just directs that water in there. Uh, but that boulevard needs to be lowered in order to get the water in. Uh, right. And then also there is a way to create tree trenches which we've done in the city of Vancouver. But with existing trees, it's really hard to implement those because yeah. then you have a catch basin in the roadway, it's connected to a perforated pipe that runs along the tree corridor and that distributes the water underneath the trees, but you can't get the pipe in there once the trees are already in place. You got it. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara and Teresa. Uh, you have a question from the chat? Yes, I do. And this is from Sasha Gale. And the question is, what kind of power does a nonprofit organization have when it comes to bringing problem areas of polluted runoff to the attention of municipal governments, we are located on the Seymour River in North Vancouver. And so I think that would be appropriate to pose to all of our speakers today if they have any comments. Yeah, I'll let both of you take a shot at it first if you'd like. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to start. Um, yeah, I appreciate that thoughtful question. Um, you know, as as Andrea had mentioned, you know, Salmon Safe is our particular type of nonprofit is um, a voluntary approach to, cert to certification, um, trying to incentivize landowners to go beyond code compliance and just, yeah, voluntarily be good stewards of the environment and go above and beyond. Um, so to that extent, we always invite a conversation um, with interested parties and can, you know, proactively reach out to um, jurisdictions, municipalities to start a conversation and then, you know, whether they take it further in terms of um, bringing Salmon Safe's third party science team to the table to take a closer look at particular strategies for that given area um, is up to, you know, obviously up to that jurisdiction. Um, but of course, there are, there are um, you know, citizen advocacy groups and other types of nonprofits that um, can um, you know, bring a different approach to the table to raise awareness. I'm guessing that um, in the case of your locality, that may already be happening. Um, but that's just my my initial um, response. I'd be curious to what Nick and Andrea have to say. I think from the municipal side, their power is significant. Uh, municipalities often don't have the resources to do a lot of detailed assessment of water quality issues. And I know the city of Vancouver has looked to partnerships with nonprofits in the past. We've looked with, to partnerships with universities to try to characterize our runoff, do water quality testing, uh, and then to try to propose solutions to address some of those issues. Uh, some cities like the city of Vancouver does have a big green infrastructure department of people whose job is to look at this, but many municipalities won't. And that expertise from nonprofits can be incredibly valuable for municipal staff that feel stressed for time. Wonderful, and I think the the final thing I can add, and Teresa also feel free to chime in, is um, if approaching the municipality doesn't seem accessible, I do know that uh, the North Shore does have a quite quite a powerful Streamkeeper organization. Um, so I can post a chat to their Facebook in in the in a link to their 
Facebook in the chat if you're interested in reaching out to them. That might be a bit of a, a, a workaround as well. Okay, thank you very much. I Yeah, I, I'm in touch with the stream Cooper group too, so I can um, get a, a hold of them, but I appreciate your feedback, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. And shout out to Glenn Parker, who I saw earlier on the on the line. So you can probably send him a chat message because um, he's joined us. There's, there he is. There's Glenn. Hey. Um, yeah, so that might be a good connection point for you all. I do have another question in the chat if I'm not seeing any hands. OK, this one comes from John Corso. And his question is, um, is Emma Truhitz at the Washington Department of Ecology talking with Sam and Safe about the municipal stormwater permit development? And I'll pass that one to Anna. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't believe we've been solicited to provide input on that permit development. Um, I can share that for a number of years, the Department of Ecology's um, headquarters site was Sam and Safe certified. So they really um, you know, I guess adopted Salmon Safe and saw the value in Salmon Safe from the very beginning. So I think that, um, you know, philosophically there's alignment in terms of um, approaches to stormwater management and thinking about these topics, um, you know, as to how that comes to bear in the permit development. I can't say specifically, but um, that's where we're at today. Wonderful. And thank you for the questions. Just recognizing the time, I just wanted to open the space for probably maybe we have a time for one more question and then I have a final slide to share um, and we have a feedback form that I've posted in the chat as well as I'll put up on the screen, um, but wanted to just leave it open if there was any final questions before we do that. Wonderful, okay, well, I will share my screen. Just give me one moment here. Wonderful. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate all of the wonderful questions that were uh, asked in the discussion and also for you just coming and uh, giving us your time to listen to some important topics that we've discussed here today. Um, if you, <laughs> the, we are in the time of QR codes. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with them given the status of the pandemic. So if you'd like to take your phone, you can scan the QR code on your screen, which will bring you directly to a feedback form. And we please uh, welcome you to fill that out. It makes our lives um, much easier in determining what you'd like to hear for in future webinars and provide any feedback on this webinar as well. Um, and you can also, again, you can follow us on social media at Sam and Safe and um, Sam and Safe BC as well. And you can go to our website to find out any more information. Uh, we do have upcoming webinars, so we do encourage you to stay in touch and stay tuned. Are there any final questions before? I'll stop sharing my screen one more time just to make sure that we don't miss anybody before we, we adjourn the meeting today. Thanks, Andrea. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for joining and have a wonderful weekend or it's Thursday, but have a wonderful Thursday. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank Bye, everybody. You. Bye.